Well, good morning again. Uh, we're so glad to have you with us this morning. Um, this, uh, uh, with September kicking off, we're going to be doing a little something a little bit different. Uh, we've been working through the Psalms, and we had a, kind of a, a great time with that in the last few weeks. But uh, this month, we're going to kind of be focused on uh, some of the things that we talked about uh, at our last congregational meeting towards the end of July, uh, kind of walking through the vision. So you'll see that on the overhead. That's what that is. I'll explain that more. If you were at the meeting, you'll probably understand what we were talking about. If not, um, we, with, this will kind of be a nice refresher for everyone, especially for those um, who, are, or who are at home. Well, I hope you're having a great morning, enjoying this wonderful weather that we have. Um, I talked to my family this morning. They told me it was 118 in Southern California. So 75 and sunny with a nice breeze kind of feels a lot better than that, I think. So it's kind of great to, to be with you this morning in the nice, um, comfortable air temperatures. Well, um, on Wednesday night, we'll be continuing our WebEx meetings. We're going to be kind of walking through the passage that we talk about today, which is um, Galatians 5, starting in chapter, um, chapter 5, starting in verse 1. So if you have your Bibles, you can probably kind of turn that now. But um, So please join me. We have been having some really good discussion on the WebEx. Um, I think it's been really good for people who maybe feel uncomfortable, you know, in, if we were meeting in here or whatever, to be able to join through social media um, and through the WebEx has been a great way to, to interact with each other. We've had great conversation, and, and it's never too late to join. So don't think, oh, well, I haven't been doing this for the last several weeks, and so I, I shouldn't come in the middle of it. Well, if you're worried about that, we're about to start something new. So this is a great time to kind of um, come in on a Wednesday and join in. All you need to do is um, we'll be sending out the links to as many emails as I have. If you are interested in that and you're not on the email list, just let us know, and we'll make sure we get you on that list. Uh, second, there's going to be a, a prayer meeting um, tonight at 7.30 through WebEx. If you're interested, please contact Mike Bresca. He'll get you on that email list and got a great way to, um, to interact with people. And um, if you feel uncomfortable praying in a group, this is one of those things where you could kind of show up and even just put your, mute, you know, your mic on mute and just listen. Um, or maybe type in a chat about, you know, something that you need a prayer request. So you know, this is not about, you know, putting people on the spot, having to pray out loud. I know that can be quite, you know, um, nervous for, for, for a lot of people to do that. Um, and so one of the things that we're going to be doing also, because this is the first Sunday of the month, we'll be having a, a communion video that will be sent out. But also one of the things that we've been doing, especially when the church was, you know, before COVID, we've been having kind of a benevolence fund offering. And that's a really important offering as well as at the end of the service, you know, um, anyone who is, uh, feels called to and would like to give the church will have, you know, our regular time of uh, offerings and tithes. But we'll also have a benevolence fund offering. Now, let me just kind of explain to you for those of you who don't know what this is. Um, a benevolence fund is used to assist members of uh, First Baptist Church and, and their families. Most of all, the funds can go towards anything from groceries rent, electricity, heating bills, medical bills, car repair, insurance, all kinds of other needs that you may have. It can also go towards um, people in the community. So if you have um, you know, a close neighbor who's you know, going through a, a rough time and uh, we'd like to, to talk about that as kind of helping them with their needs, that's uh, definitely important. And uh, uh, the, the, the deacons take care of that. So they kind of make a lot of the um, uh, talk about the best way to do those things and to bring out the funds that are needed. So that's kind of a, a really neat um, ministry, and we've um, been, that's been a, really been a pleasure because we've been giving a lot of money towards that and been able to help people in the time of need. Um, there's so many needs out there, and it's a great way to have a fund that we can give. Um, if you'd like to donate to the Bevelins Fund, you can do it two, one of two ones. If you're here, there'll be a collection plate at the front or the back on your way out. Also, if you would like to, you can also send a check to the church. Um, to for those of you at home, to you know, First Baptist Church of Waterford, and uh, you know the, the address there is on the website, um, so you can kind of look at that as well. And just write in the memo, you know, Bevelins Fund, and we'll make sure that those funds get designated to the right spot. So I just want to let you know about that. And so there will be a collection plate at the front and the back entrance. Um, also, I'm um, coming up in on um, September 25th, uh, which is actually five days before my birthday. Hint, hint. Um, <laughs> I hate announcing birthdays. I don't know about you. I, I, like if my birthday just goes on, you know, without anybody knowing, it's kind of nice. But, um, but CareNet is having a golf tournament on, on September 25th. Uh, and this is um, for anyone who's interested in, in uh, all the, the proceeds go to, the, to that. Um, the, the price is $125. And then there's a dinner also. So if you're not really into golf, but you want to go to the dinner, the dinner is $30. Um, and the start time for that, uh, I think registration is at noon. And then there's a shotgun 
gun start. Um, no, they do not fire off a shotgun at the uh, at the care night golf. If you've ever been a part of that, they usually have like a, a um, you, everybody gets a designated hole that they start out on and then they'll have like a horn sound and then you can start playing. So if you're interested in that, um, you know, please let uh, CareNet know. They have, a, I think, a, a thing on their website. Um, you can also um, let us know. But uh, Katie Geese is the, um, you can contact her by phone or email. Um, if you're um, interested in that, uh, let me know. We can kind of pass the information on to you um, this morning. Uh, CareNet is just a wonderful ministry and they have a, a pretty, you know, pretty neat to have a golf tournament um, to sponsor some of the ministries they've been doing. Uh, we've had a, a couple, I don't know why, but the last couple of weeks we've had several people who have broken their feet. And I don't know if there's something in the water or whatever the last few weeks, but we've had a several instances that um, this week, Cindy DeCosca broke um, her ankle and her foot this week. Um, and that's why she's not here this morning. Um, and so uh, there'll be kind of an email going out more details and also kind of a list if you feel like making her a meal and bringing it to her house, which is a great way to, to serve our, our uh, a sister in Christ. Um, but she's okay for meals this coming week, but it'll be kind of the next week if, that, if you want to get on that. There will be an email that will go out about that if you're interested. So uh, nothing um, new at this time, but just be praying um, for her. We also have a big praise. Um, it's great to have Mary Joseph back with us this morning. Um, you know, and her husband Joseph, it uh, seems like they've gotten a, a pretty clear path, you know, for being cancer f- free. And so that's, that's uh, a great place. And we've been, you know, preparing and uh, praying for you and your family. And uh, we're always here for you. And there's anything that you ever need, please let us know. And so um, we're just so thankful for that. It's great to be able to, you know, to praise. You know, we've, with everything going on, it's, it's, it's wonderful to be able to praise um, this morning. Now, again, we're kind of, you know, going through this tough time in, in, in life. And I really kind of have been iterating this a lot. But I think it's important that we just keep, just try to keep connecting with each other. Uh, we, I've, my wife and I have gotten some emails and texts. We had um, some people just drive by and kind of, you know, wave at us from a, from a far away distance. And it's amazing what that does to you when you've been kind of staying at home a lot. And so try to connect with someone um, this week, especially if you haven't heard from somebody or if it's been a while since you've um, uh, kind of gotten out. So just um, um, the, the continuing to do that. Also, just... Sometimes we, we get so lost in all the things that we're doing and we forget that the one who is going to get us through this mess is Christ, him alone. And so we need to trust in him and trust in each other and we'll, we will be, uh, be able to get through this tough time. Now, if you remember, uh, we've had, uh, back in late July, we had a congregational meeting about kind of laying out our vision kind of for the future. And during this meeting, the Council of Elders and I laid out a vision for the church. And so this vision is where we would like to see the church in the next, you know, five years, kind of casting out a a long-term five-year vision. And you'll see the the kind of the acronym there that will, I will explain that in the back, so it should be on the overhead uh, right now. Um, Now, this a vision came about through much prayer and deliberation. And we are really passionate about this and about doing God's work that he has set out for us. A lot of times it's more about you listening to God and God speaking to you and you laying out his vision rather than the vision that you may have. Um, and that's really important there. So we're very um, passionate about this and looking forward to implementing it. Now, again, this vision and, um, and the associated actions are not meant to be accomplished in one year. And so, but we, we will try to be um, kind of implementing them throughout the year and in the years ahead. So remember, this is something that we're kind of casting out. You know, imagine what life would be like five years from now. That's kind of what we're trying to, to put in, into place here. Um, so as, as students, as um, you know, God's word, we will continually to learn from each other, practice things, put things into place as we learn. And so that's really important. And the one big thing here is that, you know, remember the mission of First Baptist Church is to become and make disciples who love and serve Jesus. That is really our heart of our mission that is all over our website. Now, just as a refresher, we've talked about some of these goals as we set out our vision in July. And if you are not able to make that, I, or weren't able to go to the WebEx um, um, web um, conferencing software that we had during the, me- the meeting, I want to kind of lay out to you kind of the acronym that you're seeing on the screen. So in order to actualize this vision that we talked about, we need to basically go back to basics. 
as it were, and focus on four items. The first one is service. Service to each other and to the local community. Our, really, our mission field, this has been a church that's always had a history of missions. But one of the things I think sometimes we forget is that our mission field, our primary mission field, is, those, is right beyond those green doors behind you. Right outside of our, our community, our closed, you know, our community here is to, to walk out these doors and we are entering the mission field. And in one church I was in, uh, they had a sign on the top of their door that led to the outside and it said, you are now entering the mission field. And I think that's a very important motif that we should all be looking at, to serve each other in our local community. The second one is that we will create and cultivate an environment that is conducive to disciples of all different age groups in our church. That is the, the second letter there, the E word for environment. And so we will kind of have also kind of a renewed focus towards young families. Now, listen to this. This is more of a, our, our focus on young families is not because they are more important in any way, shape, or form. Rather, it's because they're a very difficult group to reach with the gospel and make disciples. I mean, we are kind of being comp um, competing against all kinds of different things. Think about, um, you know, back when you're in your 20s and 30s and um, some of you who are still in that, in that age range, imagine all the things that you were active in doing. And maybe you're still active in those things. Things like work, after school activities, sports, various commitments. I remember when I was growing up, it seemed like we never had a night where it was just nothing was going on. It was one school event after another, one sporting event after the other, one club after the other. And so things can get quite competitive with, with things. And so how do we reach a group that is very difficult to reach? Also, we're, one thing I think is important too to, re, to remind everybody is that we're not in a competition with other churches. So we seek here at First Baptist a crowded heaven, as it were, rather than a crowded church. We like to um, shout from the rooftops about the ones who are coming to faith and being discipled in our congregation, not how many necessarily how many numbers we have here at First Baptist. So keeping that in mind, I think it's really important. We will need everyone in the congregation, all age groups, to help fulfill this vision. It's a very difficult thing is to reach people in a group that are so busy. So the third letter here on the other E is to focus on evangelism. Now, one of the things I think is important here is that we're going to learn how to reach out to our community and show our faith while practicing social distancing, which can be quite interesting. But think of your neighbors, you know, you have fences and you can sit and stand or whatever six feet apart and have a great conversation. I had a conversation with somebody the other day, you know, across the street. We were just, you know, waving at each other and had a great conversation. And so that's important. And we're kind of learning how to share our stories about how we came to have a personal relationship with Christ. It's amazing how that works. Just talking with people. I would not be standing here today as a Christian if it wasn't for friends of mine in college just sharing their Christian story with me. Not trying to beat me down with the Bible. Not trying to tell me how much of a wretched sinner I am. Just sharing their life with me and sharing what Christ has done through them. And so that's really a thing that is important. So kind of focus on evangelism. And the fourth thing is that really gets back to the heart of our entire vision and mission as a church is to make disciples. Remember the Great Commission. Now go and make disciples of all nations. It's from Matthew 28. And that's really kind of the heart of our mission here. So looking at this overall, if you're kind of trying to remember how to do this and thinking about these things, I've kind of tried to come up with a, an acronym and that's, um, I think, important to help us remember. Remember these from school, we're learning how to, you know, things, you know, mnemonic devices. Well, so the four letters here, you have um, S-E-E-D, which spells seed. So um, service, environment, evangelism, Discipleship. Those, these are the four real items that we are going to be focusing on over the next five years. And so what we are really focusing on here is planting seeds, tending to them, nurturing them to maturity. Those of you who enjoy gardening, 
And I don't know a lot about gardening, but my mom used to do it a lot. And so one of the things I remember her is planting seeds in the ground and watching them sprout. And as they grow, you, you've got to take them from the smaller pot to the bigger pot and allow that to grow. And sometimes it grows so big that now you've got weeds that are growing around and you've got to prune things and sand things and do all kinds of th- uh, things to your crop. So you can allow them to be nurtured and to mature. So think about that's kind of what we're we're doing. So we're calling you to all of us to plant a seed. Just little things that we can do to plant a seed in someone's life. Conversations, bringing them food, talking to them, volunteering, you know, a week out of of the month to do um, some sort of ministry here at the church. We're not calling you to change the world. We're not calling you to sign your life away for the next five years or anything like that, but just how we can plant a seed. And so that's really important. As stated in our mission statement, we are seeking to what? To become and make disciples. And I think all these um, goals um, reply right back to that mission statement. Making disciples really is the heart of the church. And of all the different churches that I have you know, been in or worked in or, or visited over the years, one of the, the biggest thing that is lacking, I think, in every church in America is discipleship. It's the one thing that has been forgotten in the church today is discipleship. And why is discipleship difficult? It's because we can't put discipleship on a spreadsheet. How do you quantify discipleship? Because we all grow in Christ at different rates and different times. And discipleship really is a process that takes years I've been a Christian since 1998, and I have a lot of things I need to learn about Christ. And some of you may be sitting in this room and thinking, well, I've been a Christian for 50 years. What else can I learn? Well, God has all amazing, wonderful things in store for your life because he wants you to keep growing until he calls you home. So good disciples like um, good students are consistent, are intentional in their growth. Um, That is who we want to to be and who we aspire to. So again, all these things are not going to happen overnight. But if we work together, focus our eyes on Christ and learn from each other, I think that we will be able to plant seeds that will grow into trees and that will bear fruit. So the month of September, um, always, I don't know why, but especially, you know, in the school years, almost seems like a new year for whatever reason. Yes, the calendar is still 2020. We haven't gotten out of this horrendous year yet. I've seen signs, just please bring 2021 right now. But in the fall, what do we do? We, we focus on when the, when the kids go back to school. We settle in for a new academic year. Kids will say, hey, I can't wait to go into my junior year of high school, or maybe they don't want to go into the junior year of high school, but they're going to the next year, kind of something new and exciting. And one of the best parts of this time of year um, has always been the school supply shopping. Now, some of us may absolutely dread that. Others of us may love that. My wife is one of those who loves to go shopping for new, uh, new pens and pencils and notebooks and all primed for potential. In fact, you know, we're, my wife and I are in our, in our 40s, and, any, and during the fall, she always wanted to say, hey, can we go to Staples? It's back to school season, so I can look at all the new stationary supplies. So the word disciple means student. And so, therefore, as we become better disciples, and to make disciples, it seems that we are kind of be using this month um, to remind ourselves of what we're doing here, about what our vision is. And so each Sunday this month, what we're going to be doing is kind of unpacking one of these goals that we have in our vision, and we will study it and come to a better understanding of our mission and purpose here at First Baptist. So, and there may be some homework to do. I promise that I won't um, give you anything that's going to be too harsh or too long or, or grade you too severely. That's kind of a joke, by the way. So let's begin our first goal. So we're going to be looking at um, the, word, the, the, the first uh, word of our um, acronym here um, as the uh, acronym for service. So we're going to be looking at a text, um, Galatians 1, uh, sorry, Galatians 5, uh, starting in verse 1, which is really all about, the context talks really about loving and serving our neighbor, about what that means. And so for those of you who sanctuary, sure we'll have that passage on the overhead. If you are at home, um, you can use your, your Bibles or your cell phone or whatever you have with you. But let me read through um, first, uh, I'm sorry, uh, through Galatians 5. 
For freedom Christ set us free. Stand firm then and do not, be, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Take note, I, Paul, am telling you that if you get yourselves circumcised, Christ will be not any benefit to you. Again, I testify to every man gets himself circumcised that he is obligated to do the entire law. You who are trying to be justified by the law or alienated from Christ, you have fallen from grace. For we eagerly await through the Spirit by faith the hope of righteousness. For in Christ neither circumcision or uncircumcision is accomplishes anything. What matters is faith working through love. You were running well. Who prevented you from being persuaded regarding this truth? This persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole batch of dough. I myself am persecuted in the Lord. You will not accept any other view, but whoever is, it is that is confusing you will pay the penalty. Now, brothers and sisters, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the Christ has been abolished. I wish that those who are disturbing you might also let themselves be mutilated. For you were called to be free. Brothers and sisters, only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out or you will be consumed by one another. Let us pray. Father, we are so thankful for this amazing text that you wrote through the Apostle Paul and everything he's been through and went through, God, that we have the privilege of being able to read that any day we want, any hour we want, and as for often as we want. And I pray that this um, passage that really focuses on the freedom we have in Christ and the fact that we can serve um, you and serve each other is because we are free and the things that God has done through us. We thank you for your many blessings, and I pray, God, that the words come in my mouth will be from you, and I pray that your spirit will speak to us and help us to apply what we've learned today in everyday life. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, um, Galatians 5, the first verse there, for freedom Christ has set us free, stand from then and do not be submit to a yoke of slavery, is really the heart of this entire letter of Paul. And so Paul wants this congregation in Galatia, which is kind of a group of different churches. Remember we talked about 1 Peter was written to a geographical location. Well, here in Paul's letter to uh, the Galatians was a group of different churches that really is a strip um, of land that goes from southern part of the southern Turkey coast to the northern Turkey coast, if you remember kind of the uh, present day um, country. So what Paul wants us to do and wants them to, what wanted them to do is to be free from having to live under the bondage of the Old Testament sacrificial system. Freedom from the bondage of the present evil age, which Paul talks about in Galatians 1.4. Free from the grip of sin, death, and the devil. He's shouting from the rooftops, you are free in Christ. But what does it mean to be free? We talk about that, you know, freedom. That's what we were base our entire country on, is freedom. So to have freedom in Christ means that if we have trusted in Christ as our personal savior, we are now being or we are now liberated to be what God wants us to be and to do what God wants us to do. There's such a freedom in Christ. When you become a Christian, it's like that backpack that you've been carrying around with you with rocks is now unloaded. You are free. Freedom in Christ is being set free from the power of sin and death. Freedom in Christ is being liberated from anything or anyone that may have put us in bondage. Sin, bad habits, generational curses, addictions, selfish behavior. And because we've been liberated from this in Christ, we are now able to be free to serve others, to do what God has called us to do, to be the person that God wants us to be, to enjoy life as God has given us on this earth. Scott McKnight sums this up beautifully when he says, but paradoxically, this freedom from is at the same time a freedom for and a liberation to. One is not set free to do whatever he or she wants. 
Rather, one is set free to do what is right and to, be, and to do what one ought to be. In short, for Paul, freedom is the very heart of the gospel. God sets us free through Christ and his spirit so that we can love God and others. He has saved us for something. So what would happen here in Galatians? You have these false teachers who had infiltrated this church. And Paul is trying to tell these Christians that you need to be free of their teaching. And their false teachers were teaching this message that were telling Christians that they needed to basically submit to the rights and the regulations of the past. They were telling them that they need to embrace the rules and the regulations of the Old Testament law and the circumcision practices and just put aside this Christianity business. And so Paul was quick to remind them right out of the gate that the church at Galatia, that we must heed this warning. You need to be free in Christ. Because what he says here, if you look through verses 2 through 4, is that if you let yourself go back to the old ways of life, what happens is that if we allow our past to determine how we live in our future, then Christ is not going to have any value to us. What does Paul say here? Take note, I am telling you that you you have got to get yourselves circumcised, that if you do this, Christ will not be any benefit to you. Because you're basically saying here, I don't need Jesus. I'm going to go back to my old, comfortable lifestyle. That thing that I remember, doing the Old Testament sacrificial system. And he says, anyone who is doing this is now obligated to do all the things of the past that they were doing and not be free in Christ. So Paul is saying, you have an option. You can choose the grace of Jesus or the bondage of the past. And that is really kind of the heart here of this message. That Paul wants us to do what? To look forward. To see this bright horizon that Christ has set up for us. That we have a choice to make. Paul says here we can long for the past to return. Or we can embrace what is new. So how do we walk out of the past? And some of us may need to do that. We may feel like, hey, there are so many things from my past that I just need to put away. I've been there, bondage to whatever, that you need to just put down and forget. As I mentioned this before, I come from a long line of alcoholics. There's about 20 alcoholics in my family, including my, some loved ones of mine. And so I had a pretty oper- good opportunity to walk down that path myself. In fact, I was pretty good at it for a while until I became a Christian. And what did Christ do for me? He says to me that you need to give up that old way of life, that you need to let go of that generational curse. And so what I did was, is I said, I'm not going to do this anymore. And I gave up drinking cold turkey through Christ. That was a long time ago. But that is what Jesus is wanting us to do, is to liberate ourselves from any bondage that is holding us on to moving forward. It can be something like alcohol or drugs, or it can be something um, a lot smaller, control, or whatever else that we're dealing with in life. So how do we walk through our past to the other side? Well, we allow faith to work through love. That we have faith in Christ should do what? It should lead to a life of service and love towards our neighbor. Those who are going through different problems, and what are they telling you at the um, kind of the the 10, 12 step method at Alcoholics Anonymous? That you need to focus on others, not your problem. And so one of the things that we need to do to be liberated is to just to try to get our thinking from ourselves and start to think about other people. And it's amazing what happens when that happens. It's because when we start doing that, we become free of our bondage to whatever it is, how trivial it may seem to us, that we can be free of that in Christ. And because we are set free by the work of Christ, we are able to do what? Through the Holy Spirit to live out a life of freedom where we can freely love people and serve others. 
But those who are not showing love to Christ, Paul says, that what? We are or obeying his word or loving our neighbor, we really show that we really don't have much saving faith at all. Remember what James says in his letter, faith without works is dead. So what does the Lord want us to do? The Lord wants us to plant seeds for him. And if we plant seeds, we will produce fruit. And if we keep doing that, what will happen? If we keep producing fruit, one day we will produce a future harvest of righteousness and eternal glory in heaven. This is where we're going. This is our destiny in life. So faith and obedience, faith working through love, a passage we will do with in Galatians this morning, are basically two sides of the same coin. Faith and obedience go together. When, when your faith is growing, you want to obey the Lord and you want to serve him the, to the best of your ability. And the more you obey him, the more you're willing to trust him for the next stage in life. And so these two things are working together to grow you in Christ. Remember what Paul says in Romans 1.5. We have received grace so that we might bring about the obedience of faith. So we are saved through grace, through faith. I think we all would um, affirm that. Yes, absolutely. But this is important. But if our faith does not lead to acts of service and obedience, then the scriptures say that we really have no faith at all. Look at verses um, seven through following here. You were running well. Who was preventing you from persuading and ruling this truth? The persuasion does not come from you. The one who calls you a little leaven leavens the whole batch of dough. I myself am persuaded in the Lord that you will not accept any other view, but whoever it is that is confusing you will pay the penalty. Now, brothers and sisters, if I still preach this circumcision, why am I being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the Christ has been abolished. I wish those who are disturbing you might let themselves be mutilated. This is tough, tough language from Paul. But what Paul is saying here is that I am so passionate about you and about you growing that I don't want anything or anybody else to mess that process up. And those who are trying to do that to just go away is basically what Paul is saying. Very tough language. Right? So what Paul wants us to do is to stay focused, stay on the task, stay, stay on what God has done through us and has promised us and wants us to set out on. He wants us to do what? To plant seeds in the hearts of those we come in contact. But we must watch out for those who may cut in, the text says, cut in on our quest to complete the vision Christ has laid out for us. Paul uses a really neat, amazing track and field illustration here. He says, ancient runners did not run around a oval track. I mean, if you've uh, kind of, I've seen some runners do the kind of a cross country, or if you've been you know, to track and field, they'd run kind of around in a circle. But in the ancient world, they would actually run out to something and then run back. So there would be a post somewhere out in the distance, and you'd have to run, touch the post, and come back. And so what would happen was if someone cut in on another runner, especially in the last few yards before the post, what would happen to the second runner? He or she would fall over. Like you cut off a runner. I remember one time I was out with my dog and running around with a dog and the dog just ran right between my legs in a full sprint. And I did one of those tum you know, tumbling somersaults laid out you know, in the grass. This is kind of what's going on. Someone has cut you down. And so what happens is, is doing this in a race is really unsportsmanlike conduct. Now, there's no official that comes out and blows a whistle and does all you know, these things on a Sunday. But that is kind of what Paul is saying here, that someone has cut you off. And so Paul wants these false teachers to do what? To just get out of the way. And not block the path of those who want to be obedient to Christ and fulfill what Christ has called the people to do. Paul, in essence, tells these people, if you are going to try and deliberately trip us up, then you might as well just go away and leave us alone. Strong language here. This is what Paul is saying. So Paul has no time for those who try to hinder the growth of those who want to grow in Christ. Which I think is an onus on us is to don't let anyone mess with you growing in your relationship 
to Christ. There's nobody that is worth that. If you have friends who are trying to keep you from growing in Christ, then to be honest with you, those are maybe friends that we don't want to be spending our time with. I gave up a lot of friends when I came to Christ. A lot of drinking buddies when I became a Christian. But you know what the amazing thing is? Is that God will put other people in your life that you can grow in Christ with. People who can walk alongside you and help you grow in this relationship. And so that really is an important point here. So Paul wants us the entire body, the whole body of Christ to grow. So what happens here is that if we are, we doesn't want any kind of selfish individualism has no place in Paul's church. But we are what? Free in Christ. And so what Paul is saying here is we are free to do what? Not to do whatever we want, but we are free to what? Free to serve. Free to serve others. Look what he says in verse 6. For in Christ neither circumcision or uncircumcision accomplishes anything. What matters is faith working through love. Love. That is really the heart of the gospel. We are free to serve others and to do what is best for the group. Unity. If you look through all the letters in the New Testament, unity in Christ is one of the most prominent themes throughout the, the word. Union of Christ helps us to what? To learn how to serve each other better. So freedom for Paul is interdependence. It's a term that's been used in psychology, which means that we are all together, not codependent, but together. And we work together to accomplish goals. So we're interdependent, not independent from each other. John Stott, a famous theologian and pastor of a, a wonderful church um, in London, he, uh, he passed away several years ago, but he was the pastor at All Souls Church in London. He sums this up beautifully. I love this little quote from him. He says, true freedom is freedom from my silly little self in order to live responsibly in love for others and for God. True freedom is freedom to be our true selves as God made us and meant us to be. Look at the last part of this passage, verses 13 through 15. For you were called to be free, brothers and sisters. Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, doing things that help ourselves out and not others, but serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and you devour one another, watch out, or you two will be consumed with each other. So Paul is calling us all to live a life of freedom to serve others. Following, uh, followers of Christ are free in Christ, but true Christian freedom expresses itself in service and love towards our fellow neighbor. Those we like and those we happen to not like. Now, one of the things I think is really important here is uh, one person I was reading this um, week uh, reminded me that the mark of love is the ability of believers to get along with each other. You may know the hymn, um, famous hymn, they will know we are Christians by our love. I think we can all probably recite that in our minds right now. We are free and empowered by the Spirit to do what? To live a life of love and service to our neighbors. Being free to serve means that we are what? Free to serve out of love and joyfulness. That is really what God wants us to do, is to serve people in a genuinely loving and joyful way. It's not about service for service sake. It's not service because the pastor told you to go serve people. Or because we just like receiving affirmation from people when we serve them. You know, we live for that thank you. I really appreciate that. And we don't serve our neighbors so we can come home and kind of check off our things to do today box. Rather, service is service done from a grateful heart and a joyful heart. A heart that can't wait to help and serve other people. 
And so one of the things I think is here is that if you are serving with a joyful heart, it's all about being aware of what God has done for you and is now wanting to do through you as you move forward in blessing others because God has blessed you. God blesses you so you can bless other people. We talked about this when we were looking at 1 Peter. And so what happens is the more that the Lord blesses you in an abundance, then that abundance overflows and you can't not but just help someone else because you have been helped and been serviced to as well. So ultimately in place, we are what? We are free to serve. Christ has saved us not just from an eternity without God. Salvation is not just simply fire insurance. Christ saved us also for service. The reason that God saves us and doesn't just rapture us up into heaven right after that is because he's all given us a job to do on this earth. Talents, gifts, all kinds of things that he wants us to do for his kingdom. So Christ gave up himself um, for sins to rescue us from this crazy age that we're in. But he also did not come to be served, but to serve. And as the Gospel of Mark says, to give his life as a ransom for many. He gave up his life for others. And he calls us to give up our lives for other too. Christ calls each and every one of us to a life of service. We are free to serve because of Christ. So I have some homework for you this week. No, granted, there's not going to be any test or quiz. There's nothing you need to post online. We're not going to have any, anything like that. But some, some things to, to think about. So what I'd like you to do is two things this week. Read through this letter of Galatians at least once from start to finish. It should take you no more than 15, 20 minutes. And ask yourself two questions. One, what does it mean to be a Christian? If someone, if you saw someone walking down the street or in a cafe and you're sitting there reading your Bible for your open devotion, so someone walks by you and says, oh, I see you've got a Bible there. What does it mean to be a Christian? What would you tell them? That is, how would you define what it means to be a Christian to others? And the second question is, how should we govern our lives in light of this? So that's the first thing. Read through Galatians and answer those two questions. How would you define what it means to be a Christian and how should you now live out that Christian life in the community? These are some questions that we will answer as we work through the sermon series. The second thing I want you to do is to pray. We learned about how to pray a few weeks ago and so I want you to pray and think about how you would like to serve others in Christ. How would you like to plant a seed in someone's life? So in order to do this, we need to do what? In order to plant a seed, we need to participate, volunteer, and serve others. Now, this becomes a lot more challenging in COVID-19. How do we do this? How do we serve other people when there is parameters that are surrounding our daily life? We all have masks on. I took mine on so I could preach today. We all have masks on. We all have to stay six feet apart and do all kinds of other things. How do we volunteer, participate, and serve? But there's all kinds of other things that we actually can do in light of this pandemic. Simple things. And simple things all while re remaining safe and secure and not having to worry about getting this. So we can do what? We can call a high risk neighbor before we head to the grocery store and see if there are anything that you need. I have people call me and say, hey, I'm going to the grocery store. What can I get you? That might seem trivial, but you know what? When you're on the receiving end of that, it is wonderful. So we can call a high-risk neighbor and see if there's anything we need to get at the grocery store. We could um, ask people, obviously in the church, but even better would be to ask someone in your community, your next-door neighbor, hey, you saw them outside. Hey, I'm going to the grocery store later. Do you need anything? Quart of milk? Dozen eggs? Pie? Whatever? Let me, you know, let me know. I can go get it for you. Simple things like that that we can do that really going to bring us a, a heart of Christ to others. So plant a seed in someone's life, nurture it, and watch it grow. That's what we're all about here at First Baptist. So for those of you who have either like a crop of fruit or vegetables from your garden, I know some of you have told me that you've got a lot of you know, fruits and vegetables. Are there some that you could share with someone else? 
Simple things. Leaving a basket of fruit by someone's house. We can send cards. We can make phone calls. We can send a gift card. We can drop off a batch of cookies. These are simple things that we can all do in light of the pandemic. Text someone we haven't texted to in a while. The list is endless. It does not have to be some sort of grand gen, um, gesture. We're not going to uh, take someone off on the Concord to Paris for the week. That's not what we're calling you to do in service. Simple things. All we need, all Christ is calling us to is to do this in a genuine, joyful, loving way. That is all that he has called us to. Simple things from a genuine heart can really change someone's entire life. So remember um, the scripture passage in Galatians today is, is a call to freedom in Christ. And we are set free from everything. We are set free from what powers of sin, death, the devil, our past, all kinds of things that we have been troubled by in the past so that we can do what we can move forward into the future with him. But we are also free to serve others in Christ and share the love of Christ with other people. Remember that song, they should know we are Christians by our love and demonstrated by our actions. Let us pray. Father, we are just so thankful, God, that you have redeemed us and liberated us from our past, from the, the problems that we've had in our past, from situations, from sin, from death, from all kinds of other things. And we are now free to serve you. We are free to grow in you. And we look forward to the service that you have called us to. I pray, God, that we will be um, reflective in this week and the weeks to come and think about what God has given us and the gifts and talents that he has provided us with that we can serve other people with in our community and our church and beyond. We look forward to what you have in store for us here at First Baptist and what you have in store for our community and for the world. We're living through a dangerous and dark time, and we look to you for the things that we need, trusting in you to help our lives grow in the midst of chaos. In your blessed name we pray.